Mother. How are you, Sean? Very, very, very good. Nice to see you agreeing, man. Yeah, thanks, man. I've really been excited about this podcast for a long time now. Lovely. Um, I think you kind of, even if subconsciously or consciously, I think you're a big inspiration behind us doing this and kind of trying to get something going on this form. So, yeah. Really a big thanks for coming through. I know, it's a pleasure, man. For those out there who aren't familiar with Marva, the great Marva, uh, he's the brains behind multiple award-winning shows. <laughs> Last week, you won, won another award? Yeah, we won, we won the Liberty uh, Radio Award for Best Daytime Show. Jeez, and that's like pretty Would much the pinnacle award, wouldn't well, you Well, it's the only one we have in this country. So. <laughs> okay, nice. I mean, that's... We, that's... we take it with... Uh, with pride. Nice. That's, yeah. I mean, that's amazing. Really, congrats again. Um, Thank you, man. That's your first one at Power FM, am I correct? Yes, that's okay. my f- that's and, our first award. And before that? Well, I'd, I'd worked at 702 before I, I, I joined uh, Power FM, mm-hmm. but uh, I never really entered the awards. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Is that like a new concept that's come over long over the years? Well, the awards used to be called the MTN uh, yeah. uh, Radio Awards, and then they took a break, I think, for a year. Okay. And then they were, they emerged again late last year, just for this year. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And they then really aim to just uh, acknowledge and award good radio in this country. I think from that's all across sectors, from uh, campus to community to public broadcasting to commercial radio. Nice. So do you all compete against each other, or is there different divisions? Uh, there's different categories, because... Oh. We all sound very different. different yeah, yeah. Nice. You know, different categories. And um, I mean, do you think it's a good thing that's kind of happened as it promoted the radio kind of concept and that to have these awards? Do you think it's a positive? I think it's a positive thing. I mean, I think they've governized uh, people in the sector and in the in, in the medium. True. Yeah. The, people get quite excited about them nice. every year when they tell us that you know time to enter. Tell us a couple of months before. Yeah. Everyone gets excited in the newsroom and in just in general production and radio. Nice, yeah. And people love being shown out and winning awards is always fun. Yeah, I mean, your, your sports <laughs> team, God, I love the last few mornings. I haven't been able to stop laughing. You're award winning. That's everything. the yeah. best sports team in the country, I tell you. And I completely agree. God, it's, it's more comedy and, and well, it's more sport, but with a dash of comedy always. Yeah. I love it. It's always entertaining. We do a different kind of sports, which yeah. is, I think, something that's needed. Definitely. As a niche for everyone. And so that whole like overall vibe, I think, of power. With him, where it's very serious and formal, but yet there's a very relaxed kind of not re- relaxed, I want to say, like in a or colloquial, it's just mm. very real. I think, I think that's the word I'm looking for. It's, it's no like butted up and then corporate kind of look, it's all this is who we are and this is what we are. And I think that's a big part of your guys' success, I think, over the few years, yeah. yeah. And that's what we aim to do to whatever conversations we have, whether we're talking about the economy or politics or lifestyle, try to make it very accessible, like how I would talk about those issues with you yeah, okay, sitting yeah. across the table. I don't know if to sound academic and you know, use all kinds of jargon. And yeah. Do you think with the voice wake up high and, and all <laughs> no, that? No, 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 yeah. no, no. no. It's, <laughs> it's literally conversation. I don't even call interviews. I mean, you came on the radio show and yeah. I said, when I, you're coming for a conversation. You're coming to share your thoughts well, yeah. on, on whatever we were discussing on that day. Yeah. So I call them conversations, really. That's nice. Yeah, I think that changes the whole frame. It doesn't frame it as like this formal, tense interview yeah. kind of thing. Where, no. yeah. I mean, there's a, space, there's a space for that as well. Yeah. But what we try to do is try to just... Get them yeah. more accessible to a lot more people. Oh, nice, and doing a great job of it. You, you live like in quite a unique position in South Africa, where you literally at the coal face of like mm. South African issues. Besides journalists and social workers, mm. I think few people have to deal with the issues of real South Africans on a day-to-day basis, like you do. I mean, does it ever get like too much having to to deal with them? Or does it? Or is there like a way that you can switch it off and just treat it as work? Or, or like, what's it well, like? I think it's difficult to separate myself from my work. I take it quite personally, and that's why I never really, I'm never off the clock. Generally, okay. even if I'm at home or or I'm with friends at a dinner, I'm always thinking the conversations we're having. How could they spark a lovely radio show? Or how? Uh, meeting someone, maybe sitting and talking to an Uber driver and just hearing what they're thinking. Sometimes it sparks an idea. Yeah. I'm like, oh, maybe that could be something we could explore. <laughs> but I mean, another thing that happens when I, in radio, someone calls and ha- they have an idea or they want to share or they or they are upset at the president or, or some yeah. politician. You never really know what a person is going to say, even if you've been following them for quite a while and you maybe even engaging with them quite regularly. Yeah. You, you, every call I treated as, even if you pissed me off yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for that, yeah. Uh, but today is a new day. Let's yeah. start from scratch and let's see what you have to say because you could just make the contribution that 
you know, lights the spark in everyone. It's like, oh my gosh, yeah. we, we didn't think about it like that. Or I never thought of that angle. Or maybe that's the solution we need to take going forward. Okay. So you never really know. It's, 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 it's an interesting space and I love being in it. Yeah. But it can be quite exhausting as well. No, I'm sure. But uh, like you say, I mean, like because everyone's so unique, I mean, each phone call must be exciting. It's never going to be the same boring old thing, unless it's a Jacob Zuma conversation or something like that. But generally, you know, I mean, it's pretty polarized views. Uh, yeah, but even those, I mean, they, over time, let's because uh, Jacob Zuma's story is not just a one-day story. Yeah, it's yeah. a story that kind of have has layers and layers and layers, and people's sometimes opinion evolve over time. You might find someone starting off thinking, oh my gosh, he's probably the worst president ever. But then some more things happen and then they say, you know what, maybe he's not too bad. Maybe he's not too bad. Or maybe people get the president that they, they vote for. Well, yeah. well, what do you think of that whole like, kind of situation at the moment? Like, I don't, I don't want to probably get too deep into it, but I mean, are you feeling optimistic? Because like I say, you see the South African in a very different view from the way we all do. Mm. Um, just from like my view, I've, I was fascinated how that whole Gupta debacle. I mean, last year it was just unfolded and unfolded, and it keeps on unfolding. But there was that Dubai incident, like a few, like what end of last year, mm-hmm. where fakey mentor came out and, and confirmed that they'd offered her a job. I mean, mm. Jonas had come out and said, "Look, they offered him the job." There was all this hype. They had jumped on a plane. They'd gone to Dubai. It felt we, like it was over. And we thought it was the end of Zuma. I mean, how could you get a, yeah get in, could get out of that? And then it but, just kind of uh, they popped back out of nowhere. I do not. I'm not a political analyst. I don't try analyze. I don't try and predict what could happen. I just see what happens in this country because I just don't know. I don't know. Some people have fallen for way less than what the president's done, yeah. and he seems to be quite resilient. I think he plays a very smart political game. Uh, he's got his people in his corners, and those who don't like him, you know, sometimes fall out of favor inside the organization. Yeah. So it's interesting. So, so would you say you're more excited or, or nervous? For the... I'm a uh, healthy tension of both. Because <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, I'm not completely despondent about the country and not thinking it's going down the tubes. Yeah. I think there's a lot of South Africans, yeah, most of us, and we want to see this country work. True. Uh, but, uh, yeah, when all this political stuff kind of clouds maybe our bigger picture of you know doing meaningful work in the country, it's a bit difficult to to really have a uh, you know take a stance on, on on where you stand. Yeah, I try not to. I just uh, roll with the punches. I think yeah, uh, over the years, I think <laughs> it's a lot I, better. I, I don't internalize it; otherwise, I'd have a heart attack and I would die every day. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, I think that is seriously great advice. I mean, I used to for a long time, and I mean, still some topics. I mean, like religion or something like that. I'll still get that. It kind of worked up with it. Yeah, and, and it's so true. I mean, I think over the, especially the last, which may be a negative in its own way, but like you say, it's either that or have a heart attack from stress. But <laughs> I think I, over the last year or so, I've been able to let go a lot more on the political side where you just kind of, it's just the same old tricks, really, you kind yeah. of just see. So, yeah, but I, I think that's great advice not to internalize it because. I mean, stress is the number one killer, and I think yes. this can be a very stressful place and sometimes. As black people, we've got high blood pressure <laughs> that kills us, so try not to, I'm to raise the, I'm <laughs> the HP <laughs> levels too high. But I mean, fascinated just to what you're saying now about religion. What's your, do you have a serious gripe against religion? I, I do, I do. I mean, I would go as far as to say, like Christopher Hitchens would say, where he's like an anti-theist. I mean, yeah. I, I believe that you have the right to believe in what you yeah. but I think it's important for people to know there's there's kind of ramifications for what you believe I think the, the two main issues that I have with religion at the moment one is it disenfranchises you from yeah. your own ability and it's your easy. responsibility it's takes 100%. it away from you. you someone must provide or someone will take care of it or, out there or there's a the plan state. that's working in your favor or yeah. something you know and preordained <laughs> that's it I mean you've got no choice it's, it's happening whether you like it or not yeah. and I think that's so disenfranchising I mean you can't do that to people you have to tell people that every second of every day you can make decisions that can empower your life and make it a better life. I completely agree with you. That's exactly what I think. But then I've seen religion be very comforting to people when it's times of death. Or, 100%. So I, can't, uh, I can't argue with that. Because, you yeah. know, some things you really can't explain. And the only thing that will come uh, as a parent has lost a child would be the fact that yeah. hopefully the child is in a better place. So I, I, I take what works for me yeah. and, and, and leave what doesn't. And I think on the second point, that's really like fascinating just from, especially because of the, the scene we're in at the moment with the whole like decolonization. Mm. I mean, religion, especially Christianity, and people say like, I have a crap with Christianity. It just happens to be the biggest religion. And probably the one you're exposed to. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in a Lebanese household, a yeah. Maronite Catholic. I mean, 
not that there's a price for it, but I mean, but you'd be really hard pressed to find a more religious group of people than Lebanese. They are extremely mm. religious. I was an altar boy. I went through the whole process. So I know the book backwards pretty much. I think mm. that's why it's an easier target for myself as well. But like I said, just in the whole colonization thing, I mean, there is no better embodiment of colonization than religion and Christianity. Yeah. I mean, because it, it took over the mind. 100%. And, and people think that, I mean, I don't have the documentation for like, or, or the, the backing for the stories within Africa, but it's so well documented in South America where they would bring down the king of the tribe and they would give him a book, the mm. Bible, and he wouldn't know what this book is because he never had needed for a book. Yes. And he would throw it on the floor and they would say, okay, <coughs> you've, you've denounced <coughs> Christianity, yeah. you're dead, and they would kill him. So like people think that the colonizers came and they were just like, oh, here, here's the Bible, accept it. And he was like, oh, this is so nice. No, they, they killed you if you didn't accept it. Yes. And then you, if you had the child, you didn't want your child to die, so you baptized your child and just got them in the uh, cycle. And it was so indoctrinated. Uh, and you can draw parallels with what's happening with ISIS. Uh, in the current modern stage where they're calling everyone infidel if you don't believe in what they're saying. Yeah. So, I mean, you can it, see the dangers there. It just repeats itself over again. And, and like, it's just on that last point, I mean, it's just, it just said the idea that the more you suffer in this life, it's okay, don't worry, there's a life afterwards you'll be yes. rewarded for. That is why yes. it's so sick. It is disgusting. Yeah. It is so repulsive, that idea, because people brought into it, it justified their suffering in this mm. life. Just, I mean... Because then they'll have a better afterlife. Life. I mean, no. Like, so it's, I mean, on those issues, it, it would be hard to like... That, that's pretty much my issue. I mean, besides getting into the fundamentals, the, the, the hate of anyone who's not a straight white male mm. like as well, that's, that's a real issue in my, in my life. Really. But just putting that aside, I just think... It, it can do more destructive than good, but yet I will um, definitely admit that there, that there is some good that comes out of it at times as well. But mm. I just think if people knew the balance and weighed it up and just kind of empowered themselves more knowledge and then make a decision. And not abdicate your own thinking that, to a higher power. Super, yes, yes, That's yes. Because yeah. I think you're given a brain. If you do believe in God and that he gave you a brain and not then I, I, I would think you'd want to use that brain. 100%, yeah, 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 to the best of your ability yeah. to, to honor him. Yeah. I mean, is, is that your biggest topic that you, what, what topics get the most phone calls usually? South Africa, we're a highly politicized society. It's normally the politics. More than religion. More than religion. Religion gets people <laughs> extremely upset or extremely happy. Yeah. It like, it takes them to the, almost to the ecstatic side of, of the spectrum. But politics... I think they're, they're a bit more thinking about it. They're a bit more sanguine. They formulate thoughts and they... But religion is just they believe it and whatever I believe, I That's believe. And, yeah. and you are all going to burn because you don't believe what I believe. No, but I find that it, it, gives yeah. you the, it gives you the extreme and it's difficult to have a conversation around some of those issues. I mean, I remember once uh, when I worked at a different radio station and I was very... After months and months of working, we managed to secure... Uh, not Richard Dawkins. Oh no way! Uh, yeah, so, we, wow. so we had a chat with him. He was, I think, it was at, at the university, not Oxford, but one in London. Okay. So we had a whole hour's discussion with him, wow. and it was based basically on his book, The God uh, Delusion, Delusion, and uh, and, oh, and and we had tried to unpack that. People were so upset. I mean, but it was interesting how people were upset. It was black people. It was white people. It was mainly all the Christians, mainly, but oh, from different races. They united against being upset <laughs> about against someone saying that a God doesn't exist. Yeah. So I find that so fascinating. At least we find one thing that brings us together. <laughs> that <brings> us together. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like that was that Angus Buchan. I mean, last weekend, like we're saying. I mean, yes. when you see the pictures of it, I mean, it is heartwarming to see. I mean, like we said, it's disputable whether it's over a million people, but it was like a huge variety. Yeah, of I, I saw I saw the pictures and the aerial shots there yeah. in the farm in the in the free state. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't yeah. know. I, I, I'm terrible at, at estimating senior. crowds. Yeah, I mean, me as well. I'm not a professional. <laughs> it's a huge amount of people. But like I said, I mean, if, if you just got 10% of those people to like go and paint the inner city or something, that's like 150,000 people. It would take an afternoon. We could do a huge exactly. amount of physical good. Exactly. Or, or go and, I don't know, Instead of uh, sitting and, and hoping that a higher power will, will make it happen for us. I mean, I must confess, my mom won't be very happy when she sees this. <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> it's very religious. As but most people <laughs> are. Yeah, but yeah. we, we agree to disagree on many things, religion. Nice, so we, one of the conversations we don't discuss because I've got very strong views that sometimes, you know, are not welcomed yeah. by... You know, the face people. Nice. But I mean, it's good to have that ability to agree to disagree, I think. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know. Nice. I mean, cool, so what do you do like outside of the whole work sphere? How do you, what do you do with your spare time? Because you were chatting to me earlier that you work for ENCA after power every day. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, yeah. Just, just before I answer that, yeah. you were asking me 
and uh, between religion and politics. Yeah. And I just want to, I don't think I delved a lot into the politics. Yeah. And I think the people are interesting because especially, as I said earlier, we're a highly politicized society and everywhere. And I think it's because it really politics affects the economy and then it, it hits the bottom line and then you feel it. I mean, we we like now junk. Yeah. And it's, we're going to feel it if people haven't already seen it with their pension funds. Yeah. So I think politics takes just a bit longer to, to hit them hard. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. they, they struggle a bit with that. But they, they're very thinking, they're very sanguine. I mean, issues of the economy. I'm surprised as to you think someone is an average listener calling you from a melody, and they actually they understand quite a lot about how the banking collusion and how intricate it was. Exactly. So you can never really assume where a person is from that they don't understand what's going on in this country. That's powerful, yeah. Yeah, so everyone who calls me, whether it's from Soshangouva, Soweto, or, or Greenstone, <laughs> 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 I'm like, oh, let's, let's see what I can learn from you because I also learned quite a lot from just talking to the listeners. That's powerful. I mean, that's, yeah. that's awesome. And I think that's why we're doing this as well, to have these kind of things because, I mean, it's so interesting, the stories of people and the lives that they've lived to, yeah. to kind of do that. And I'm saying you get... 10 an hour story and that's pretty, pretty that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, where do you think like big business fits into this whole thing? Do you think they've kind of like gotten away with, with this whole, because kind of talking to the political thing, like I said, affecting people's life, the junk status and stuff. Mm-hmm. I am, I mean, if you want to get me rolled up, don't worry about religion, big business and corporate yes. inequality. Wow. I mean, it just seems that these guys were, were definitely silent. They were the ones paying for the big, big uh, breakfast to sit yeah. next to Zuma. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, they were junk status that their pension funds are now being affected. Uh, now we can hear them talking. I mean, did, do you ever get like much of a reaction when it comes to big business? Or do you think it's a lot less than people would think? I think with big business, it's always interesting because I think they are normally with whoever's in, in favor at a particular time. Yeah. So if the Guptas are hosting this lovely breakfast and they get to invite it and they can sit next to Zuma and pay, I don't know, 100K a table or whatever, the ridiculous amounts that they do, yeah. they'll do it. And then as soon as um, Tulima Donsela comes up with the report and says, you know, that these guys are, uh, are not so kosher in how they do their business and then they'll cut off their bank accounts. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's, capi- it's, a, it's classic capitalism. It's looking out for yourself. <laughs> and then pretending like nothing happened or deny it. Yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, I've just always been fascinated, like, the way we, we're pretty passive. I mean, we, we lay a lot of issues on government, but I think, like, whether it's your education, I mean, how do you expect a parent to, to earn less than 3,000 rand a month and has to wake up at 4 in the morning and catch mm. two taxis to save for their children's education mm. or their medical aid? And that's the thing is these companies actually paid people a lot better. They, at least people could make kind of decisions that are empower their lives. Mm. Like, I don't want to rely on a government hospital anymore. I've mm. an extra couple of, and let me get a medical aid or mm. something like that. But it all starts, I think, at the salary. That's where all these decisions happen. Uh, where you allow people to empower themselves. So, I completely agree with you. You pay people a decent wage, then they'll take care of so many things and they won't be so sick and they'll actually come to work and be more productive and be happier people. That's it it. actually will do very well for your bottom line and you'll get more of those millions. Yeah. If you did well with the people who you work and, with, and I don't understand why sometimes I find that big business doesn't see that. Yeah. Maybe it's just easier to but keep how, people. How, how do you sleep people. at night? Though? Honestly, I mean, I seriously. sleep very well in in, in the mansions and in in, in, in front you can stand and yeah, But I think that's why <laughs> not to be. We should have anyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that's why they they like always the, the heart attacks at fifty, and so maybe it does catch up to them one way or another. Because uh, I think you can't really. I'd like to think people are, can't be so distant, dis- detached or be so cold. I mean, you're borderline psychopathic killer just about if you can literally detach your emotions to say, I'm going to pay somebody that's going to enforce them to live in a less than good or standard yeah. standard of living. Yeah. That's going to enforce their children to continue to live like yeah. that. I mean, as someone who's an entrepreneur and works in that space, I can tell you now the vast majority of CEOs' qualification was something that I call a WMM. It's been white and male on a Monday. <laughs> that is the vast majority of these guys' qualifications. And that's why they that's shouldn't... Good yeah, I mean, and I, tell it to, I tell it to their faces. Mm. I mean, it's part of my thing is that I really believe that a lot of these guys have gotten away with murder at the end of apartheid, these big businesses, by not just saying, well... Business as usual. Not mm. okay. Look, we back, we made huge amounts of profits. Whitey Bison and Shoprite and all these guys of 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 basically slave labor in a in a time that was deemed a crime against humanity. Maybe we'll just double everyone's salaries for the next 20, 30 years just to like kind of pay back. Nothing. Well, the shareholders are not going to be very happy with that, and some shareholders are not like involved in the day to day running of the but business. But we, the shareholders, if you ask them, they'll tell yeah, us because we buy. I mean, without us, we don't go. If you don't go to Shoprite, we all decide not to. Or our pension funds. I'll say no that through our pension. 
pension funds, yeah. we all shareholders. Well, then if we as shareholders give you the thumbs up to go and pay people better. I mean, uh, why is he supposed to make all those shareholders, 50 of them, or however many, how many there are that go to the AGM? Very happy, I say, you know, I'd manage to just give you off a couple of people <laughs> and uh, yeah. got a couple of bobs for you guys. I more mean, than I'm sure he's got last more year. than a, a line around. I mean, if you think about it, if you just took like um, Nicky Newton King, for example, the JC um, CEO, CEO yeah. yeah, I think last time I checked on Bloomberg, she earns around about 1.8 million rand a month. Which is nothing for a CEO no, in nothing. this country. Can you imagine 1.8 million rand a month? That's like three houses <laughs> in a month, cash, boom, gone, and a car maybe even. Like, yeah. Wow. But I mean, like, by CEO standards, that's not the... Uh, yeah, the mining guys shame uh, the time. banking guys are doing very well, oh, yeah. I think, and they get those added bonuses and share schemes. I mean, well, we must talk about Brian Mulefer's 30 million that was taken back and then... Given back and given back. back. <laughs> I mean, geez, what type of pension but is that? That's exactly... I was having a conversation in the newsroom with some of my colleagues. I was like, I, I have no idea in my head. 30 million, I, I can't grasp it. It's too many zeros. It's, it's too big a number. Mm. It's, it's it's something I think I'll never probably earn in my lifetime, unless I strike it lucky with the lotto, <laughs> which is very unlikely. But I was like, these guys, and this is obscene amount of money. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, what do you? Uh, I, I don't understand. It, yeah. it boggles the mind. Uh, how, how, what do you do with it? I mean, just sit what on kind it. of lifestyle is? Grand uh, yeah, lifestyle. I mean, what is it? Is it jetting off every day to Paris? Uh, what, what is literally it? would have to be. You would think. I mean, like, do you wear gold suits? I mean, in order to spend that kind of, even if it's a million rand a month, like, which is like you say, not a big salary for some of these CEOs. How do you spend a million rand a month? That is insane. I mean, like, but I mean, they do get taxed quite a lot as well. So, uh, if you're earning a million, I think you're probably getting forty percent or so a little bit more uh, uh, shame, tax yeah. than that. Yeah, poor like, little. Rich I'm sure they work it into it, so it works out all just fine, and the. Bonuses and also the offshore accounts. Don't yeah, worry, they're okay. Those are well taken care of. Yeah, Panama Papers disappeared quick. I uh, can't believe how they just yeah, no, disappeared. That, that's an old story. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget what it did. 100%. Um, but I mean, some of them go when they do foundations. I mean, the Ackerman's family, yeah. the, the, the pick and pay guys, they've got lots of foundations where they do quite meaningful work in the community. Yeah. But then you'll see why do they, instead of focusing on maybe not start the foundation, but pay your casual workers <laughs> who <laughs> are in the till, uh, who, are your wage, who are your communities, why don't, don't they? say charity begins at home? 100%. I mean, the, I think you guys had an MTN guy on not too long ago as well from some foundation. I'm, I might not have been on your show, but definitely mm. on Power. And I saw a phone through and I was like, why don't you rather just save all your foundation money and just pay your employees better? Employees better. Yeah, I mean, you'll have a far bigger effect. I mean, what are these corporates... And you'll see like a direct impact, that yeah. you, uh, a change you've done. But then, then there's, they must contribute to the Fees Must Fall movement because they're corporates and, you know, Barclays Bank, I think they just started a fund. We spoke to one of the ladies yeah. from Barclays Africa a couple of days ago about how much they've put into education that uh, so you can access the money like if you're at a university you go to your financial it's like a aid. loan or as a gift? Uh, as a bursary oh, okay. which, you, which, you, which you would still pay off well, I think they call it a scholarship it's a, I don't know what the different definitions are okay. but a scholarship you don't pay it off and you don't have to go work for them but as long as you continue to study and do well I was like I mean, you know what that's a good cause that is uh, I think, I mean, it's it's a little, like, I mean, better late than never, I guess, mm-hmm. they say as well. But, I mean, it, it won't help the, 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 the teller person whose child is studying at such a bad school that they won't even get an opportunity to go to varsity 100%. and apply for that uh, funding. That is so true. And it comes back to salary. I mean, if you're earning a bit more, maybe you could take your kid out of a government school, which mm-hmm. is obviously, like, wishful thinking for a lot. But, I mean, you see the growth of the private school sector as well. I mean, there could be a lot more affordable schools out there soon for people instead yeah, of having yeah. a choice. I mean, there's, uh, there are still some good public schools out there in the country, I say. Yeah. I mean, I was having a conversation today. Just not in Vowani. Yeah. Uh, not in Vowani, <laughs> not in Vowani. She, she lived in Valcom. Okay. And she went to, she was telling me what it's called, who School Gymnasium Valcom. Very good public, very good public school. I, I don't know you could be a high school or a gymnasium. I thought you could only be one. <laughs> a little bit of both. I'm not sure. But she's telling me how it was a really good bu- public school, and it still is a very good public school yeah. in those small towns. Where I mean, every year they get their hundred percent matric pass rate right, and a yeah. couple of distinctions for the kids. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know how you replicate that in. Uh, in a big city like Joburg, because uh, it seems like the state of our public education is just not not be. good. I mean, like the schools around here generally um, uh, have always uh, stayed a good standard. I think is uh, the St. John's and uh, no, no. I'm talking about like <laughs> Eden High or okay. like Eden Glen High. Guys within like. 20 kilometers from here. I mean, yeah. there, there's some really good schools. I mean, I went to Spring Boys High. I was going to ask. It's okay. a really good school. Nice. I don't know what it's like now. No. I haven't been there in like 10 years. Yeah. 
But it was a really good school when I was there. It was yeah. proper. We had training facilities. Yeah. Teachers were always on time. Nice. Disciplined. Yeah. Was, I loved it. Yeah, nice. I went to Dunvegan as well. I mean, for my primary school. And uh, same thing as well. It was like a perfect school. I had such fond memories. So, mm. I mean, I think there are still some Chinese Some Someone's that work. Yeah. And I think it comes down to the passion of the teachers and the principals and stuff. And I think, yeah. And support from the government actually funding the schools and making sure that, you know, there's have textbooks and all that Textbooks well. are there. And, I mean, it's... I'm talking about giving the school enough money so that they pay the guy who mows the lawn. It was a big thing. Our school had a big lawn, big rugby culture. Yeah. We did a good money kid. <laughs> Look after him as well. Yeah. No. Nah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, getting away from the whole politics and business side of things and stuff, like I was saying earlier, I mean, do you have, like, anything you do hobby-wise, fun-wise, activities-wise? I read, I read it a lot. I love, I love reading fiction. Reading? No, I love nice. reading fiction. What are um, you reading at the moment? Or? I'm reading Zadie Smith's current book. Okay. And I just finished uh, Trevor Noah's... Uh, oh, he's all about Griffin. Born Griffin. a crime. Yeah. It's, okay. It's interesting. I yeah. mean, he's our boy making it big out there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Trevor. <laughs> support to you. But, I mean, I, I, I try to read some... I love watching series as well. I'm a big documentary fan. Okay. So I collect a lot of them and I watch a lot of them. And thank goodness with Netflix and all those things nowadays, we, I'm getting like... As they get released in the States, get them almost simultaneously. Brilliant, yeah. I, I uh, think there's been such a huge revo- revival in the documentary culture. I mean, mm. when I think back, like, when I was younger, it was, like, David Attenborough and, yes. then, like, some shady, dark Panama. Uh, sh- yeah. One, yeah. And there's different kinds. I mean, there's, like, I just watched a lovely one about Nina Simone, who's my, oh, favorite, one of my favorite artist. I think it's called What Happened, Miss Simone. Lovely dokey. It's all footage that was never used of her in interviews or... Wow. Uh, in concerts it just paints such a picture and that daughter narrates it Jeez. so you get a lovely sense as to wow. who the woman was you know quite feisty because those people were like I'm fascinated by me it's one of my biggest um, hobbies in that uh, talk about music and I think that was such a strange era like pre-internet like yeah. even the 90s the difference between that and now now you said like in the 50s and 60s and even before that the artists there were such brilliant guys but yeah. there was so much mystery around them and I think yes. yeah, it's so important that they, people they, are putting they, it they, together because you Tried to find out as much as you could, but there wasn't the internet. It's fascinating. I just, because I love buying CDs, I still, no, uh, I, I, should, I should do the iTunes or whatever. But no, I, I still I'm still a big fan of CDs. <laughs> the album is a real thing <laughs> still. I love and, it. Uh, yeah, and I got a Fleetwood Mac uh, collection. Oh, brilliant. And it's got, you know, when you open a CD and it's got that little booklet. Yeah. It's got a whole story for like four or five pages. Wow. About, you know, where they were at that time. Yeah. Why, you know, what inspired some of those songs that, you know, Stephen X and Big uh, yeah. <laughs> Fleet were fighting about. Yeah, okay, that whole scene with the sleeping <laughs> around. <laughs> Yeah, the but you like, it's like, fuck, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, please say, go. We, we, it's, it's the internet. We can do whatever the fuck we want. To. <laughs> but I love that old school things. You know, you're not, you're not going to get it with the iTunes. You're not going to get True. a booklet that's going to tell you, you know, how this album came about. Mm-hmm. So I love music. It's a big thing of my, uh, and my taste is pretty broad. Is I'll enough? do classical. I'll play it in my flat. So love that my neighbors will come knock. Listen, uh, classical. <laughs> classical. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> play the Baroques. And no. the, but then I'll play uh, your Stevie Nicks and okay. your Fleetwood Mac. That's Best band ever, by the way. Mm-hmm. And I will not hear anything else no, from no, anybody. R- Rumors <laughs> is one of my favorite albums ever, I think. And also, like, I mean, they had a hugely dynamic band to think. Yeah. They were around from, like, the early 60s, or yeah. Yeah, pretty much from day one in yeah. the rock scene, and, and they're still around. They're still around, and they just, I mean, I tried to, uh, it wasn't very successful, but they did a um, reunion tour where they toured the whole of the States last year. Oh, wow. As all of them, because, you know, <coughs> Christine McVie went and lived in a, a, a solitary life okay. and kind of left the band, but then she came back last year for that reunion. Wow. So I'd hoped to see them before they die, but it looks like it's not going to happen. Just like I'm never going to see Johnny Mitchell because she's now falling apart and Gee. she's dying. <laughs> that's an amazing taste of music you have. I think that's so awesome. Wow. Uh, I like, uh, yeah, different things. I like yeah. adult contemporary. Yeah. Then I like a lot of local stuff. Okay. But that's, I find I like local stuff only for a season when it's nice and hot and it's on the radio. Yeah, yeah. But then after that, I'm not really yeah. going to bother to go back. I think it's so <laughs> fascinating that whole staying power thing. I was like, um, there's a great example with um, one of my favorite albums, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. Yeah. It's been like 748 weeks on the Billboard Top 200. That's like 18 years. On yeah. the, and like you're saying, I mean, now music just literally... Yeah, no, it's tell me what was good three months ago. I, I will not tell you. But Ed Sheeran... Shape of you, I don't know. Uh, I think yeah, <laughs> that sounds right. I, mean, I haven't so listened I'm to five of them for like ten years or something. Like, I mean, yeah. I found seven or two pretty early, and then I left kind of uh, pop music behind. I think from there. But yes, yeah, so, I mean, I've only really gone into my blues guys over the, like the last four or five years because I was so fascinated with the Rolling Stones and Zeppelin yeah. and all of them. Yeah. And it was always like they had such love and respect for the blues guys. And yeah. I, eventually, I was like, okay, what is this stuff? And I would dived headfirst in Soul Blues World, and that is truly like 
some of the most there's a brilliant movie called Cadillac Records I don't know if you've watched oh yes uh, with Beyonce I, I was Beyonce yeah she plays yes, Edda yes, James yes, and that, Edda yeah. James and things at last and uh, yes yes <laughs> uh, um, that was my really good my first dance song in my wedding actually well, I lovely. love this song yeah. lovely it's a very romantic song I yeah. imagine everyone should dance to it <laughs> at their wedding um, but should you, they get married yeah then you see like the life of like Muddy Waters and like all those other guys which are, they were, I think yeah what those guys went to and a lot of them died penniless without getting the credit they deserved, which I think is But the, the music crumb. still lives on. I mean, with, uh, I'm still into that kind of music. Yeah. I'm still into my Credence Clearwater Revival. It's kind of like one of the best bands ever. Definitely. I love Rolling Stones. Nice. It's a yeah. really great band. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then I like my the stuff that my dad imparted on to me, like mm. Diana Ross and you know, Aretha Franklin and the soul and the, mm. the deep R&B as yeah. well. Yeah. But like very, very early, like your Curtis Mayfield. Oh, yeah. awesome. Green in that? Oh, Green. Oh, I yes. love that. Yes. Yes. So yes. Much. Enjoyed so, so much. Yeah. I mean, Ray Charles. Really lucky to get that CD shop that day, a really nice CD. Yeah. It was almost all his un- not popular stuff. And it's really, really cool, cool oh, music. I think Ray Charles and... Um, the guy who uh, the, he was the blind guy, Rachel. He's the guy who got killed. Stevie, no, um, Marvin Gaye. Marvin Gaye. I yeah. think they like they names that people throw around a lot, but I even took like uh, Ray Charles. I haven't really given him the, the time I think he deserves. He's really got some good stuff, and you'd be surprised as to how much of his stuff music you know that maybe has been sung by so many other people. I mean, like there was that like, blurred lines and that kind yes, of thing. Hey, yes. that, kind of stuff, yeah. no, that, that was a Marvin Gaye. Uh, oh, Marvin Gaye was it? Yeah, because I remember they were trying to they sue were suing each other yeah. and they settled. <laughs> I think they actually filed some pre under the legal term and they were like you can't sue us for stealing your thing because we didn't steal it yeah. it's like if you, if you have to file that paper I think we both know you stole it <laughs> but, <laughs> right, yeah. but, yeah. but Marva thank you so much for coming through I think we'll leave it there for today if that's good with you and that's oh, and great thank you we'd love for you to come through back when you've got some free time maybe in a couple of months and we can have a chat again I'll do that thank you very much okay, so. thank you so much for tuning in and we'll catch you on the flip side thank you, thank you Marva